whenever I'm radiating anything in GI, I throw a little 5-FU in. Is, who's with me on this? Well, uh, you throw Cape Cytobine. Okay, so Cape Cytobine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so we're actually, we have a study, for example, with TAS-102, using that as a radio sensitizer. Mm -hmm. I, I, think it, I think it's a general principle. It's true that chemotherapy, especially the fluoroprimidines, will amplify the effects of radiation. And we, we see that as well with any of the fluoroprimidines. So we tend to do the same. And you know, I've heard a bunch of different uh, data points on this, but what I think is the common thing is about two to three weeks of radiation is being delivered. So you give the shot and there is some dose, you know, radiation dose being delivered. So I kind of want some drug on board. Absolutely. Uh, even in patients, I would even argue in patients who were refractory or progressing, I throw a little in, just like if I were radiating a, an esophagus or a rectum. You agreed or? You know, I don't tend to do it during mm. or have it like a pump running while mm. they're getting the, the Y90, but I do take it up to maybe a week before the Y90 and then you can restart it afterwards. And you can restart it afterwards. I do think there's the other push that I've heard that, um, that the IR people know about bevacizumab mm -hmm. and their, their belief, and I think there is some evidence to suggest that if you've given Bev recently, then the vascular supply isn't adequate. They get less delivery uh, to where you want to go. So at least my IR guys mm -hmm. and gals want me to be a few weeks out from Bev. Yeah. Everybody the same there? Yeah. So in a frontline setting. In a frontline setting. If, if you want to use it as a maintenance strategy, uh, you have to give them a break from the Bev for, for six to eight weeks. Okay, so chemo is safe to give during the base, we can tell. Um, you've got to watch your Bev multi-step process, pick your patient. I'll, I'll just one other thing about my concern on this is, is toxicity issues that um, I know Alan and I've talked about this before is that in giving liver directed therapy earlier, if I'm got a few years to go, what's that liver going to be like? And we all experience sort of that pseudo cirrhosis, mm -hmm. this hypersplenism, that sort of thing. Is, uh, how are you dealing with that or thinking? Is that shifting your decision making, Johanna, about when to do this? So in all honesty, it makes me a little bit more nervous to do it up front because mm -hmm. those patients generally have a long journey ahead of them. Now for specific patients, as we were referring to earlier, who've got that bulky disease where you really need some tumor shrinkage, they're not as re responsive to the chemotherapy, I don't, have, I don't hesitate in using that earlier, but sometimes it gives me a little pause mm -hmm. to say if I'm using it straight up, not having all the long-term data read out from the first-line studies, which we do need to make that decision correctly, um, but I tend to push it off a little bit more. Okay, so it's here to stay, it looks like? I, th I think so. There may be uh, maybe a better widget out there coming along, but I think the modality definitely, it's effective, and we just have to figure out where the right niche is, I think. And it's a little bit off topic, but, you know, we, it's pretty effective in colorectal HCC, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I think neuroendocrine. neuroendocrine. But you know, we're seeing this now in cholangios yeah. yes. and, and breast cancer and other places where liver dominant disease rise. Is that happening at all of our centers? It is. I'm not sure, you know, there is much, uh, or there should be much support to it. I mean, I've, I've not had really good luck with cholangio and this modality, mm. uh, to be frank. And I think I've seen it used in pancreas in some patients, and I think that's, you know, really going outside. Uh, what would be considered acceptable. You want to make the right, you know, it has to be the right patient. In it front has of to you, be the, ex the right patient. Uh, you really have to pick those patients that, and when you do, as, as, as uh, you know, all of you uh, were saying, uh, if you do, you're, you, you see really good results with this modality. And sort of the last point on this is, um, it's not necessarily either or on liver resection, right? So we tend to think of it in the unresectable patient, but uh, safe to operate after? So that's a good question. We've, we, we don't have a large experience. We've not, the handful of patients we've done them in that sequence, we've not had a problem, but I don't know more broadly. I think that's something to look at. And again, as you alluded to, earlier use, uh, you do have to worry about cirrhosis down the road. We learned with embolization, for example, of carcinoid patients that five, six, ten years later, a number of them went on to develop cirrhosis, cirrhosis. From, from biliary strictures or from ischemia. So I think we, we can't, we shouldn't rush to, rush to be using this over, be overwhelming, but I think certainly with judicious use, it's, it's the right thing to do for patients. All right, real need for multidisciplinary input, just like we're thinking resection, we're thinking our IR team and that this is out there. Not every IR guy, gal has this or is up to speed on this, mm -hmm. and so that does affect referral patterns and things like that, so we know that's a barrier uh, out there in, uh, in the community.